there was one time where I thought I was going to bomb. I was in New Hampshire at Dartmouth College. So I'm in an Ivy League, and it's just like, it was like eight and a half black people out in Dartmouth at the time, and just, you know, I'm <laughs> looking around. It's winter, so the white snow was just adding to the whiteness. I mean, it's a very interesting place, Hanover. But I thought I might bomb there, and I ended up ripping it. You know, it was like their winter break. They had a keg jump, so they were skating on I mean, these it was like madness with these white cats out here. They, these white, the frat boys, like stereotypical, like jumping over kegs. And one of them just ate crap. You know, it's a keg. It hurts. And you're on a, So anyway, we, we talked about that. I just talked about what I observed in Hanover with my time there. And people loved it because it was a different perspective from a person who had been there. So I, I think that's why they really enjoyed it. Uh, it seems like the 40-year-old the white guy is the only guy that doesn't have a group. You know, like, you know, I, I can't go out and start, you know, uh, you know, here we have like the black student union, that's okay, but the white student union, you know, or, or the, the white guy club um, just doesn't, it doesn't have the same ring. Asian sun visors that lay flat on your face like this, and then they lift up like this, like, a, like, like I drove through Cupertino and I was like going to a welding convention. My name is Michael Smith. I'm an English teacher and a writer. I am Bob McFarlane. I am a uh, teacher at Los Altos High School, as well as a basketball coach, and I own a uh, youth camp company. My name is John Talbert, and I'm a comedian that does uh, comedy in clubs. I also do motivational comedy, and I'm a actually a pastor at a church as well. That's my regular full-time job. And I love it. I hate when my wife goes to Costco without me because I go into Costco. It's the only place where I pull out my card, my membership card, and I walk in and I go, Whoosh, and the guy goes, I go like this, and the guy goes, come on, we're in. We're into Costco. And then we go in. There's big screen TVs, food testers everywhere. It's like dinner and a movie for the whole family right here in Costco. Take my kids. Hey, we're going out of the town. We're going Costco. Are you kidding? We're hungry. Circle again. Circle again. <laughs> Hit that lady up with the, you know, she's cutting taquitos in a Dixie cup right there. I recognize that humor is a huge um, tool, a, a tremendous tool that you can use to help people capture a point or an idea. I am an edutainer. I don't feel that there's anything wrong with having a kid learn something like how to write a five paragraph essay, but me making it fun for them to do. You're going out and you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. You're trying to perfect it. You're trying to say it just a little different here or modify this here or take it out and put in something new you came in with. You're always trying to assemble this kind of set. You, can't get, you, get, you take a stage and you often have the ability to come up with just material. You're supposed to come with material. Very few people, and this is something that I think is changing greatly about comedy, very few people have the knack, they have the integrity, they have the know-how and knowledge to get in front of a group and just go off of what they see. What's happening? Wait, wait, wait brother, right there, what you, who told you to wear that green hat? Like a lime green hat you wore, and is that your girl? And like just being able to improv that way without offending someone, but getting them to laugh at themselves and others to laugh at the person who's there. That to me is the genius behind comedy, and I think that's what I was drawn to. Being a great comedian is being able to establish that, that immediate connection, um, and man, it's tough to do. A unique view, it's as if you put on a weird pair of sunglasses that has a different tint on them that has you seeing the world in a different color. And, and so I'm able to, through the lens of my mind and my eyes, see the world, see life, relationships, faith, um, driving, um, weird things about cupcakes. I mean, it could be any topic, just pick a topic, and it goes through the filter of my lens. And in my style and my presentation, I'm able to do it in such a way that brings joy, brings, huh, that brings, wow, or, man, that was funny. When I do that, I feel like I've done my job. And that's, it's the same thing from a painter or a musician. They want to play and they want to invoke an emotion or a thought or a feeling from you in comedy, it's the same thing. You are supposed to make people laugh. That is your job. 
It is in your job title. As much as a secretary needs to take notes or type, your job as a comedian is to make the crowd laugh. Not some of them, but you want to try to make all of them. When I'm writing music, I want people to feel the emotion of the song that I've created. Uh, I'm working on a movie script right now. I want people to be subdued by the plot. Just, ah, I can't stop watching it. So it's the motivation behind it. And the end result with comedy is, you better have the room chuckling and laughing. How does racial comedy contribute to society? Because it can contribute positively and negatively. And it's all in the hands of the one delivering it. I think that we ha it has to be examined and it has to be understood. A lot of people want to get offended by some type of a racial comment, but there are, are, are others who say, hey, there's no substance to the claim. That's what makes a great you know, comedian when it comes to race, uh, racial uh, jokes is, um, is that you gotta, you gotta, if you're gonna go down that path, you gotta include everybody. There's a lot of comedians that don't know how to get the laugh. It, it can be difficult to do. It can be easily taken the wrong way and easily offensive to some people, um, even if that isn't your intent. And, um, you know, I respect the guys that do it well. You're talking about the D.O. Hughley's, the Dave Chappelle's, the Paul Mooney's. Like Bill Cosby, I think, is probably the most brilliant storyteller. Why is that ringing an empty phone book? I know what it is. It's a beautiful spy girl. The enemy's captured her, taking her to an abandoned warehouse where they've locked her in. Guards fallen asleep. She's knocked the phone off the hook, dialed a number at random, and that's the number. It's and, uh, Reagan, Brian Reagan. Brian Reagan plays the best dumb guy. For Jeff ox, oxen. The farmer used his oxen. Brian, what? Brian, what's the plural for box? Boxing. <laughs> I bought two boxing of donuts. <laughs> oh, no, Brian, no. So what's funny at one point in history may not be funny later. And so I think that, that's something that's constantly evolving and something that the artist has to be aware of. Like he should have known better what was gonna be funny or not in, in terms of material. So there's no set response to that one, unfortunately, I don't think. Those are the kind of bits that you would see from an, like an, in an amateur situation that, I mean, you're literally just like, oh, just pained by this not funny material that's totally offensive. There's lines that people cross, and I think you have to be mindful of that. Oh, there, there are very clear boundaries. People think this is a gray area, and that's just not true. The people decide. The public decides. I mean, if, and, and the public, you know, kind of changes with each room that you're in, you know, um, you get a lot of comedians will talk about how, you know, their redneck jokes are, are, are they don't get the laughs in, in NASCAR country, you know, whereas in, in New York, it's hilarious. So, I mean, um, the audience decides uh, what's offensive and what's, uh, and what's not. Take Kramer. That guy from Seinfeld, when he went off, you know, Michael Richards, when he went off and did that whole, that's right, I said it, ooh, and he thought that he was being funny and he got booed right off the stage. People were not ready for him in that moment to be using that language and in that context. And so people decided that for him. Uh, I think there's some people that use comedy and they cross lines and they make generalizations that are mean-spirited and hurtful, and um, and I think it just, I think what it does is it exacerbates a problem that already exists, a racial tension between uh, uh, different groups. Most comedians would, would agree it's, it, it can be difficult to do. It can be easily taken the wrong way and easily offensive to some people, um, even if that isn't your intent. There's things that are funny that allows us to come together and to go, oh, that was, that's pretty funny. Initially, people made fun of other races uh, for their shortcomings or what they believe were shortcomings. And, you know, immediately other races were, were, were offended, uh, didn't like it, <laughs> and some even willing to fight. But, uh, you know, I think that it's a part of our culture and it's hard to deny that there are aspects of certain race, with certain racial undertones that are funny or humorous. We all live in this society and we have a lot of things in common like joy and humor and compassion. Mm -hmm.